mic check.
Testing.
Vitesse. One.
Hey guys, we're gonna kick off soon, so please take your seats. Or, yeah. All right, um, let me start this. Um, good night, everyone. Welcome to Revolut. My name is Bulat. I'm the head of employer branding here. And uh, a couple of things from my side. First of all, uh, thank you all for coming. We are very, very happy to host this event to support the functional programming community. So thank you all for coming. Uh, second thing, we're going to be hosting more of these like similar events this season. They're going to be dedicated to software engineering, building products, designing products. So if you want to be updated, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter to, to, to get the announcements. Pass it to your friends who's interested in whether software engineering, data science, or building the amazing products. And um, the second thing, there are plenty of our engineers or product owners among you somewhere. So if you're interested in uh, Revolut's technology stack, Revolut's recent uh, products or more products to come, like if you have any questions, don't hesitate to talk to them. Some of them have name tags on. Some of them will, will find you themselves. So don't be afraid. Um, and the third thing, let me, let me ask you to give a warm welcome to Vlad, our CDO is going to give an introductory speech about Revolut's engineering culture. Thank you. It's probably uh, called to call a speech probably a bit too big. Uh, so it's uh, fir first of all, uh, can okay, can you hear me well? Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So again, uh, thanks everyone for coming uh, over, uh, making time to uh, you know. It's it's cool to have communities uh, around topics like functional programming, uh, other things you know where people can exchange ideas. Um, uh, I, by the way, I think I guess uh, I, I like the, the the functional works name. It's like it's, a, it's like uh, uh, recursive uh, kind of stating obvious. All right, <laughs> w was it meant to be so? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it's it's quite cool. It, it it fits really well the uh, the the idea and uh, and the main topic. Um, you know, uh, just wanted to give like little uh, introduction about Revolut. Like uh, when we what functional has to do with the Revolut at all? Uh, when we s started five years ago, and I was uh, writing down uh, the first uh, software engineer job ad, uh, and I was at the time I was. You know, all about Scala and uh, functional, and okay, I, I wanted you know to build uh, all our backend with uh, with Scala, and then I realized, you know, I, I was pragmatic at the same time. I realized, okay, maybe the market is not in the situation where there are Scala engineers on every corner, and uh, you know, I ended up putting like, okay, if you know Scala, Java, Python, whatever, just join us, right? And it happened that the first engineer, oh, actually at the time, everyone who came for the interview, they happened to be all Java engineers somehow. I, I was a bit surprised not to have all Python engineers. Uh, so that's what usually startups, top, startups start with. Uh, and uh, yeah, we started uh, building everything in Java. Uh, we built it very fast, uh, in a, there was a lot of crappy code. And then at some point we realized, okay, it's just, we cannot push features anymore uh, as fast with us creating bugs, so we decided to rewrite most of it. And after maybe uh, nine months, so after launching the products, we wrote like 90% of all code, uh, making it, basing it on more functional principles. Uh, and again, we didn't use Scala. We, at the time, went with Java, uh, but hey, who, who says you cannot do functional programming in Java, right? Uh, so we tried to build everything in uh, using functional principles, uh, which made our testing a lot easier, applying to DD, uh, thinking about the, the business value, what we want to deliver about the goals first. Uh, and to be honest, there was never like, a, oh, should, we, should it be all functional or should it be object-oriented or should we like, we just went, you know, wha with things that worked, uh, and um, I again, uh, probably the point I want to make is, you know, like in uh, with paradigms and programming languages, it's like uh, um, with the same as with natural languages. The more of them you know, uh, the better you know each of them, right? 
like even uh, people uh, even mix natural languages sometimes when they speak, especially so it's very normal on uh, country borders. Uh, for instance, and you know, people just do it because uh, it's convenient, right? The living environments between two dif different uh, nations, for instance, right? Uh, so it's similar, uh, I, I would suggest maybe to uh, who is kind of uh, not like in the in the topic of you know, or decides to choose whatever the direction is uh, to check out the small uh, blog post on. Uh, Uncle Bob's uh, site, uh, which is FP versus OP. He puts it nicely there that FP and OP is actually are not opposite. They're maybe orthogonal and complementary rather. Uh, so, but again, today, uh, you know, we use, you know, at some point I said we use Java, right? But then at some point started having guys who are passionate about Scala, Kotlin. So we started writing some things into Scala then writing them back into Java. Uh, some where Scala works, we stuck with Scala. It's kind of, we approach it in more pragmatic way, uh, not trying to kind of use the tool and uh, you know, even if we don't know how to use it well for a specific problem, but rather pick the tool that works for that specific problem. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, but again, today is uh, all about functional so uh, and we know it works so <laughs> so enjoy the talks hello hello good evening everyone um, just want to say Massive thanks to Revolut for hosting us this evening. We very much appreciate it and your very swanky offices. Um, this is the 16th London Functionals we've run, and we started off in a very small office in Shoreditch, and we've now kind of grown to this, so this is great. Um, if you didn't know who we are, we are WorkSub and Functional Works, and uh, we have built a platform that hosts all the latest and greatest jobs around functional programming, uh, F-sharp, Elixir, Closure, Scala, you name it, we've got it. We also host this event and we host a lot of blog con content on our website. So if you want to learn and you want to get into functional programming, we are here for you and we want to help you out. If you are on the lookout to learn a bit more about the community and uh, functional programming, grab anyone in a t-shirt. Uh, they're pretty obvious, I'm wearing one now. And uh, I'd actually be interested to see who whose first London Functionals event is this? Put your hand up. Big welcome, thank you very much for coming. Um, so we're gonna start the way, we've got lots of talks to get through. First up is Giuliano with a title talk, Quill, dealing with databases the functional way. Round of applause, please. Hi. Yeah, we are almost there. Maybe they are testing me. Maybe I should start telling some jokes in the meantime. Okay, so there's well there was this time when I went to Italy and I got lost, right? And Good, thank you. Fun fact, actually, I actually got lost in Italy the first time when I went there. And I thought that I would die because I got lost in doing like a track. And I started to worry that my mom would get a message saying, like in the like in the newspaper, right? Like stupid Brazilian got lost and dies in a stupid way. I was really worried about it. Yes. Okay, so thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, I think it's the first time that I'm uh, speaking at the London Functional Programmers. I'm Giuliano. Uh, I, this is my Twitter. I don't bother you too much. If you follow me, I just tweet like uh, this interesting stuff that I found around. And I'm a software engineer at Uswitch nowadays. Who here actually works with Scala on your everyday job? 
you guys are super lucky. I work with Clojure. Clojure is, yeah, <laughs> it's it's okay. It's okay. Like it's not as happy as Scala, but I work with Clojure. That's life, right? And in my free time, I spend uh, I spend my free a bit of my free time working with some Scala related tools. And I'm gonna talk about Quail because it's one that I'm dedicating. A a bit of my time for the last one and something years, right? So first of all, uh, I like to deal with weird stuff. And particularly, I think that databases are weird stuff. So a quick story for you guys. A uh, few years ago, I learned the wonderfuls of Scala, right? And I was like, yes, I don't have to deal with Hibernate anymore. I hate Hibernate, you guys have no idea. And then after looking at Scala, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that those genius came up with a proper solution to deal with your database, right? I mean, of course. And then, naturally, I start dealing with Slick. And with Slick, uh, it's awesome, right? We start with your case class, right? Just an example, like I have one user here with name, email, and everything. And then I'm like, okay, let's, let's see how it works. The next step would be this straight configuration. Okay, it's acceptable. And then, uh, user table something with the cake pattern of the DB configuration, yeah. okay. And then I have to import my own thing, uh, okay-ish. And then we have a class users that extend tag, the queues receive a tag, whatever it is, and then extends table. And uh, at this point I'm like, I, do I have to write my own table here? I'm not, not entirely sure. And then at this moment, I'm sure that I have to do something like that. And then I have that, that nowadays I still don't know what's that, or what that's supposed to be. And then finally I expose like this wall users. And I, I was disappointed. I'm like, I don't wanna write Hibernate in Scala. And like, my, my, my reaction was something like that. I was expecting more, you know, and properly like, <laughs> Jokes aside, I don't like that. I, fi I find it way too complex. I really don't know what this, most of these things mean. I don't want to describe my database here. It was my first example of how to try to connect my database. I'm already defining my schema in my code and that's not what I wanted, right? Oops, sorry, okay. Uh, that's when I found Quill, right? Quill is a tool that another Brazilian guy wrote, a guy that worked, worked for, works for Twitter, Flavio. And uh, I consider that maybe I could have found a different uh, tool to deal with the problem, right? So the first point is that the whole thing is boilerplate free mapping. So we don't have that crazy stuff saying where every single field of my case class should go in the database. It's a quoted DSL, uh, a bit more uh, about it in the next moment. And it's a compile time query generation, which means you write your code. I'm gonna show you the quote in a minute. This code will be compiled, it will be extracted. I'm gonna manipulate that and somehow, somehow generate the SQL for you, right? Then again, a bit more of uh, about that later. Let me just fix one thing, sorry. I have like I have a goldfish memory and I cannot see the next slide so I have no idea what's coming next so okay given that I was like let me show how you do that with Quill remember uh, the first moment right so the first thing we do we define our case class the second thing you do you're done it's everything you need so you have time to celebrate already in the first moment then again, uh, the database should be there to support whatever you are building, right? For a simple example, you shouldn't be dealing with complex stuff. Like later on, of course, but not in the first moment. So that's what you need in the first moment when you start working with Quill. Uh, my problem initially with Slick is this strong feeling that the tool is being built ad hoc according to whatever happens, you keep adapting. 
And uh, I was looking for, like, like I said, Scala is such a strong language based in a lot of concepts. And I was looking for something that would have concept behind as well, right, to support it. So Quill is actually based in this paper, a practical theory of language integrated query. Uh, you can see the paper here. It's a really interesting one. Uh, it's in F sharp. Uh, I, I think you're going to like it. <laughs> And I'm going to give you a quick summary. This whole paper tells you two things. No failure when you're generating your SQL. No any plus ones. I'm talking to you, Hibernate. No any plus ones. Rails as well, right? Who here had to work with Rails? Uh, actually, the only guy that raised his hand, he works with me. So, so I mentioned that there's some um, uh, theory behind that, right? So you can see that there's... That's the theory behind that. If you, you, you can, I know it looks really complex in the first moment, but I can give you my approach to, to understand this part. It's very simple. That's my approach. Just don't think about it. You, you don't have to understand that in the, the detail. However, I strongly recommend that paper before the part, uh, uh, yeah, before the part where you reach like all that, ma all that, that theory, Everything is super understandable, and it's a really interesting paper to read. Uh, of course, uh, like any other tool, it has a few restrictions, so it's it's a tool to be used in a modern way, let's say. I mean, we are in the era of microservices, right? So your service shouldn't be that big. If you have a service with like many databases at the same time, Quill is not the tool for you. It won't solve your problem. It's to handle one problem. You have one service dealing with one database. That's where Quill can help you out. Uh, it returns a flat relationship type, which means that when you compose whatever you do that you build to deal with your database, you have just one construction that you generate one SQL. Okay, can be a super complex one if you be if you build something really big, but you be always one. And it only know operations. So what does it mean? Uh, we have this SQL here. It's a quite simple one, right? The equivalent of this SQL in Scala would be more or less something like that, right? And now it comes the part when I show you what you have to add to work with Quill considering this code. And everything you need is that, right? Super complex, isn't it? With that, uh, the tool has everything that's necessary to read all the metadata behind this code here. Uh, I was making jokes about Clojure, but Clojure has one thing that makes life easier in comparison to Scala, that's uh, the concept of building macros. In Clojure, it's easier, it's easier to understand how to do that. Scala is a bit more complex, but if you work with Clojure, it's very likely that you already have uh, some knowledge about this guy, about this concept, right? So as long as we have that in place, Quill can read that and build that flat relationship that I mentioned. That will build something that's more or less like that, okay? It's, it's messy, but <laughs> you can see that there are some principles here. Uh, everything is abstracted. We have an abstract, um, A, B, C, right? Abstracted syntactic tree, yeah. Abstracted syntactic tree, this is one that we extract from that code that you give to Quill, right? To send that to Quill, we have that. We, having that and having the theory behind that, we know that we can build that thing. So we have the code quoted, Quill style, plus theory, you'll have your results. So uh, to make it a bit simpler, a simpler example, we can abstract over values. So let's say that we have a, this simple function here then again, just quoting uh, that simple thing over there. I get, I receive uh, A and B, and then I build on the top of person uh, with a simple, with a simple condition. It's important to say at this moment uh, is there's nothing here. There's it's just in memory. We will generate that in compile time when you try to execute that. So at this moment, this will become this. The thing, the secret, secret is that uh, what Quill does is it reads that that code, it generates the abstract syntax tree. That's something well defined, 
from that, you transform that in something else in the SQL. During compile time, you have the string. When you run that, it's like it's super fast because it's pretty much uh, JDBC execution. All right. I think I'm going to get a lot of questions at the end of this talk. Okay. The next one would be an abstraction over a predicate. So in a similar example, if I have a definition of a predicate where I get an int, I say yes or no, uh, true or false of something, I can in the same way just execute that. And I'm going to get the execution of this SQL here. The point of this, uh, of using Quill, is the fact that there's no mistake of generating that when you have it right here. If this code is compiling, this has to be correct. That's one of the laws behind that paper that gave the origi origin to, to the tool. You can, of course, at this point that uh, you can see that I'm using this satisfies here exactly like I would use any other function. So I can simply compose that like any other queries, or like any other function. So let's say that I have this age from name, for instance, and I add this guy here, uh, age from name, and range from the previous one, that will generate a SQL like that. A bit more complex, but then again, one single SQL for every single one of your compositions, all right? If you take that for the a bit more complex level, you have to deal with dynamically generated queries. So, so far, all the examples, they have numbers that are well-defined that I'm giving to you at that moment. But working with web applications, you get random inputs, right? And at that point, Quill doesn't know what is coming on. So you have to indicate that that value is not there yet. So you have to lift that. So you can have these definitions here, for instance, above, below, and or. And then I'll have to lift my values, those values that I don't have yet. But that's the only then again, it's another thing that changed a little bit. You know that you don't have that value, so you just have to lift that to indicate that that will be generated by Quill. If you don't have that, if you forget the lift, the only thing that changes is the fact that Quill will compile that, but will resolve that in um, during runtime. But the whole thing keeps working. Uh, so I have a simple example, but I wasn't sure if I would have internet. So a basic example would be this one. We, we make use of that feature on Eclipse that you can see. I don't think you can see that in um, IntelliJ. I don't use IntelliJ, so I'm not entirely sure. But that's a really simple example of what you can do. And like building just this quote right here, you already have that SQL being generated right there. And more useful than that is the fact that if you keep changing that, oh. Okay, it breaks in compile time because it doesn't follow your code as it is. Oof. Talked a how, how long? Uh, probably still have time. Uh, nowadays, we oh, we support all all these databases right here. Like this is what the SQL ones. This one is my baby. I implemented the SQL Server one. We have the in memory ones. The ones that are actually not uh, SQL databases, we support Spark, Cassandra, on Orient DB. There's someone writing a plugin to uh, Lagoon, but I never worked with that. And on the support side, let's say we have uh, Twitter, Finago. Um, Twitter, Finago, yeah. Yeah. We have Finago. We have some uh, one module that makes an integration with Finago. We Let's say you're already using that on your on your project, for instance. And recently, we added uh, Monix, which means that with uh, the the modules that have Monix can uh, can string the data for you. It's not like from the scratch, but yeah, we're using Monix, we are streaming the data. And someone recently, this one is super new. I actually had to add it yesterday. Uh, someone made 
a miracle and managed to implement the Oracle driver. No, sorry, not the Oracle driver, the Oracle integration because Oracle doesn't give us uh, Docker containers in or uh, the database driver is not available on um, the Maven repositories. So it's kind of super tricky to deal with that. Yeah, and that's it. Looking for a different tool to deal with my, my database, I managed to find Quill that allows me to deal with my database exactly the same way that we deal with collections, what makes everything super easy. I don't have to deal with all that boilerplate code like I have to deal when I work. Sneak. Sneak. It's not a competitor to something like Dobby. Dobby I find super interesting, but with Dobby we still write the SQL by ourselves. So it's like a different, it's a different approach to the problem. There's actually a work in progress to have a module where both of them work together. Besides, it's something you can, you don't see on your everyday job. So I find it extremely interesting because all the macros working behind the scenes and everything is super complex and super interesting. I invite everyone to go to the Quill page. Uh, if you try that, if you have issues with that, please uh, just send messages, open issues to us. If you wanna participate and send a pull request, would be super happy to receive that. We have more or less 100 issues open nowadays. And most of us just work on that on our free time, right? Unfortunately, like I said, I'm working with Clojure, so I don't have that amount of free time to write in some nice Scala. So help help you you guys can help a closure developer to be a bit happier on their everyday lives yeah, that's it any questions yes Oh. So, um, maybe I was already talk about this, but I'm not sure. I don't care it's about uh, what. How you will deal with Dotty, with macros in Dotty? Sorry, what, what do you mean? Uh, do you know that uh, macros in Dotty will be changed, probably, in some uh, on, on some level? And how you will deal with Dotty? Is, uh, sorry, uh, incubation for Scala 3, uh, 3.0. Ah, with the compiler? You mean the dot compiler? Ah, at the end of the day, you, uh, the tool just build on the top of any compiler you are using. So I, I don't think I got your request. Ah, okay, sorry. So here's the thing, uh, this started some time ago, right? Uh, there are some discussions of what you're gonna do, especially when they release the new versions of like Scala 3. I did, supposedly we will ha we'll have the opportunity to improve some of the microsystem because it's kind of complex. It's quite complex, a, a lot of that. And having the, as soon as we get Scala 3 released, some of the, Some of the features in the compiler for the Scala tree will help us a lot, but maybe because of that, uh, we didn't decide yet uh, how to go with that. So I, I still don't have a uh, an answer for you. Okay. More questions? If no one has a question, I'm gonna ask you guys questions and that will be way harder. Yes. We have like all the all, all the joins. However, I think it's a feature open to group by because group by goes uh, group by is not about grouping by specific properties, right? And uh, the group by group by is something that has to be more well developed. But group by is. You, you make me feel like look bad because group by is the only one between like the standard thing that we have proper issues with. But yeah, the, 
we are working on that. Uh, but because group by is goes beyond uh, just grouping by properties, we can have issues with that. Because I can say like group by like one, right? It, it's valid SQL. So that makes the abstraction behind that uh, weird. And like, I mean, we can go around that, but no one wants to introduce more bugs in it or something. So th it has to be well thought. Here's the thing, uh, for if, if you already worked with a framework that people are using, the way of thinking about it is different. So one feature that I implemented some time ago was about uh, when you have successive ORs, you can have like more and more parentheses to make sure that it works more or less <laughs> like closure. And then uh, <laughs> to make it simpler, the idea to remove them could be more error prone. So I actually spend like a lot of time thinking how your user gonna use that and then what you generate from that. But the group by specifically, it's a bit more complex than the, than the others. Because like select, uh, I can say, something, I cannot filter some things like uh, using what, no, I kinda can. But yeah, group by is complex. <laughs> more questions? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, the if, so if you take in a predicate, uh, for your for your for your code read session, but the predicate is comes uh, externally. Mm -hmm. how, how does it how does it get compiled? So how do you see the expression tree itself? The predicate, the whole predicate, including the code. So to co uh, to compile it down to you, uh, uh, so during compile time uh, uh, into SQL, you need to uh, you need to be able to examine the internals of the predicate. It cannot be just uh, any random fu function from a Java mm -hmm. library, can it be? You need to know the expression itself so that you can code it. No, I need to code that, but it uh, doesn't matter what is coming from the outside world and I don't know what's that. The worst case scenario where we just uh, fall back to the dynamic um, to the dynamic interpreter. So it's supposed, it, it yes, I have to code that. Something that goes, into I have to code that. At the end okay. of the day, I do. It doesn't matter the values. Uh, it can be a predicate, but I have to wrap that in the quote because without that, I cannot read that. So, yeah, I need that. Okay. More questions? Yes. Hi. Um, working similar to with, with F sharp and, and it, well, it is way better than any kind of object really uh, relation mapping. So yes, there is really, really kind of good scenarios for this, this kind of tool. Uh, I have seen that the problems are actually basically, well, two major problems. One is that there is more people that are able to write SQL than, than quotations. And, and the other problem is that it's, it's making quite hard to, to index your database because you have to kind of run through the queries in production to see that what is actually good indexes. So because of you don't see the SQLs so, so well that you, you would in other way. Yeah, I, I see your point, but at the end of the day, if you are because you main mentioned it, for instance, the indexes, right? It implies in the knowledge of your how your database works. If you're in that level where it actually counts for you because of you have like millions of registers or something, uh, Quill is not the solution for that, right? Quill it will just allow you, it's a way to simplify the way you deal with the database, but that's why we don't have uh, migrations or something like that. We don't generate the database or you'll, we won't define, uh, this will, won't define how your database works. That's up to you. Uh, it's a, a thin layer that you allow your Scala code to be simpler. But uh, the only connection is the fact that you have like the case class that's supposed to uh, relate to the database. But it's distant, right? There's no strong connection between them. You can easily, if you change your database names, for instance, you say you have a, a field called name and then you call it something else that will break because Quill tends to be simple. The idea is to have a simple way to handle that, but we are not thinking about uh, indexes or uh, hiding how to deal uh, the SQL. We are trying to generate a safe SQL, or at least let's say using the Scala compiler, we can generate a SQL that's equally uh, safe. 
that would be the main idea. And why, actually, why are you using the SQL? Do you use any validation of uh, that the SQL is valid that was generated, or you find out only at runtime that SQL is invalid? Assuming that the your the map mapping between your database and the case class are right, the SQL is valid. Right? Unless you change something that won't break. So I don't I don't validate that. There's a there's a if it compiles then you know for sure that it will work, right? So you're validating actually the generated SQL. I would say the SQL is valid. For sure the SQL is the generated yeah. valid SQL. Yeah. If there's something going on if let's say in the meantime something in your database changed, uh, the the code the code doesn't connect to the database to check. There's a way to do that, and you, that Git that I showed before actually uses that feature, where uh, it actually looks at the database to verify. But it's a bit slow. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't use it that much. I mean, I just use that for development, on my free time, not in real life. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I was wondering, are there any ambitions to optimize the query? The query? Especially if we would, so, so often we write like CRUD app and there are many requests coming in. And so one idea is to batch together multiple queries. And if you have uh, the AST, then you could do like some cross query analysis and then optimization based on that. Consider that, uh, do you mean generate a query that will perform faster or? Yeah. No, I don't, I wouldn't say so. Uh, because that relies on having knowledge about your database, right? But now that we're talking about that, I'm gonna advertise the other project that I'm working on. That's uh, <laughs> We wrote like a database driver that's based entirely on Netty4, right? And using that one, the communication with your database will be faster. So you should give it a try. <laughs> but no, uh, about that SQL, no. Uh, then again, the idea is like reading that. I mean, I if you can represent that with Scala code, you can actually generate something that would be faster uh, at the end of the day. But uh, we don't we don't have a way to to find a way, uh, because then again, we don't look at the database, like the best we do when it comes to the database is to check that. But the main idea is everything is generated to compile time. When you run that, it's just a SQL call uh, using JDBC, why we are not using the new database driver. Anything else? So thank you very much for having me. If you have more questions, when change some ideas, I'll be around. Thank you very much. testing. Testing.
Hello, hello. Hey everyone. Ooh. Next up we have almost yeah, there we go. Sweet. Next up <laughs> it's waiting. Cool. Next up we have Jorge Garcia with GraphQL versus REST round one. Give him a round of applause, please. Okay, hello everyone, how are you? Are you fine? Good? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Jorge Garcia. Garcia. Uh, I work for a technical cons uh, consultancy called Codurance. A um, couple of emails over there uh, for contact and uh, the Twitter account where sometimes I do post things. Okay, it's gonna start. Hmm. Okay, so last year I started to get uh, interested on GraphQL, uh, a new way of creating web APIs. Uh, the new it was, I think, it was created five years ago and then released on the uh, publicly three years ago, something like that. Um, we, right. um, I read a couple of books about it. Um, I must say I have to read them again because I read them before and after I did any code and some of the things that uh, they were saying over there went past me. So I will read them again. I have seen quite a few presentations and this is one of the reasons that I am creating my own present. I have created my own presentation. I'll, this is, this is uh, uh, the first part of it. Um, and it's because between different things, uh, the, all presentations that I've seen about GraphQL, they tend to pass uh, rest, okay? So you have the, the new thing and you, you have to say that it's better than the old thing. And to be honest, uh, apart from the fact that I, I like rest quite a lot, uh, I don't think it's, it is needed. GraphQL, uh, it can stand on, uh, on its own two feet. Um, without being, um, without trying to make less of uh, of rest. Okay, I'm just gonna get some meta. Oops. Uh, I copy this. Uh, okay. Until later. Um, so, well, what I'm going to show you some data that I'm going to be using. Uh, is going to be used for the for the demo. Uh, the most most important thing is that it's not uh, any kind of. Uh, Let's not call it useful data or uh, anything really interesting uh, with it. Yes, a simple file that is trying to be like if you were uh, you had a um, uh, database with some relational data over there. Uh, you have an end-to-end -end relationship between users and games and books. Nothing, nothing uh, really big so far. Okay, let's start with like a base of how I think. And please, raise your hands if you have done any REST API. REST API, anyone? Yeah, quite a few. Good. Uh, now keep, keep, it, keep it up, unless you have done Swagger, uh, you have used Swagger or API or Rainbow, then you will take it down. Anyone left? Okay, two people. Um, have you done uh, uh, how you use uh, hypermedia on the on the REST API? No. Okay. So, which is a pity because then 
from my point of view, none of you have done REST API. Um, and it's, for me, it's one of the most interesting things about, not about the software profession, it's just humans in general. We, t we tend to misuse terms. We are doing agile, but, but, but you have heavy processes, and, and you made your uh, developers write documentation that is actually not needed at all. That, that, that is not agile. Why are you calling it that? And it's the same with REST. If you are uh, ignoring what makes REST REST, then you can't call it REST. Of course, some laminary came with the idea of uh, RESTful and RESTis, which are just ways of uh, saying that I'm not doing REST, but I'm going to use the cool uh, term for it. Okay? Well, cool term a few years back, now it's not, uh, not anymore the, the cool one. Okay, I'm just going to continue here. Um, how many of you have read the original dissertation by Phil about REST? No one? Okay. <laughs> um, it is illuminating. Uh, Phil defines the REST as an architectural style, and we'll come back to that later, with certain characteristics. Um, some of those characteristics, uh, one of the most important characteristics uh, that he has over there is that, well, the data that, uh, that you're returning indicates the actions that you can take next, okay? So, hey, Toa, say, keep uh, hypermedia as the engine of application state, which is why I have promised it to like Swagger, because to like, like Swagger, what they do is make the URL, a fixed URL, the center of your API. You know all about every single URL in, the, in your API. That doesn't work with what uh, REST is supposed to be. REST, you have the, I, the, the, the links, and what it is inside the link, what is the URL, it doesn't really matter. What it matters is the semantics of the link. I am uh, trying to get a new, a new thing, I'm trying to delete anything. The actual URL, it is not important. Okay. Um, has anyone read um, Recent Practice by Weber, Paraxatidis, and Robinson? Uh, in the press world, it's one of the most famous books. Okay? Um, and the first time that I read that book, I, I didn't get it. I actually didn't get it. Um, of course, I was reading that book before I actually get any, because I was going to be working on REST APIs, so I didn't have the, the knowledge. Um, um, after a couple of years working on, on REST APIs, or REST APIs, uh, I came back to it, and, and then I saw what they were trying to tell me. And it's that the REST is all about processes. With REST, the data, the data is incidental. What you are modeling in a REST API is the process that you are following, which is exactly the sample that they have on the book. They have a coffee shop, and what they are modeling is how the ordering system is supposed to, to work. The fact that you have data about coffee and whatnot is not as important as the steps that happen while you are ordering coffee. So, no data, but modeling of processes. That's what we are doing. Now, um, oops. Uh, but, and I'll be back here. Most APIs that I have seen in the, in the world, and probably the ones that you have seen, are actually very like in processes. Okay, which is the issue that Facebook realized that they had when they were working on, when they were doing their stuff. I mean, what, what is Facebook in terms of processes? It's very, very simple. You get uh, all your, um, all the posts. You get uh, all the posts maybe filtered by a person, by one of the uh, person that are writing. Uh, do some posts, delete posts, that's it. There is no more to it in terms of what they are doing. What they wanted to 
is to deal with data. So they had to design something that was specifically designed for data. Uh, oops, I, I forgot to do something. Um, Uh, so we reach a point in which we have a clear separation between REST and GraphQL, okay? And uh, REST is processes, GraphQL is all about the data. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, don't need it anymore. And there's another big difference, really massive, and I mentioned it before, REST is an architectural style. And that means that there is no implementation of it. Every time that you are creating a REST API, you have to define the whole architecture again, the whole implementation, every single time. You have to define how your API is gonna be, behave, what, you're now gonna, what are you gonna make available, what are the links that you are gonna provide, uh, how do you do searches, how do you filters, which HTTP verbs are you going to be using for each single URL? You create the client for that uh, API. Uh, and most of it, you have to define it uh, completely in terms of the data you're going to retrieve in, how you're going to retrieve it, and why not. It makes sense, architectural style. And as well, we are talking about business processes. So, there is no solution of the uh, out there that works for every single business process in the world, okay? Therefore, I have to define the architecture and the implementation. Okay. Let's gonna move this around. <laughs> um, the data that you see over here is not as important the actual data itself. What is important is the amount of it. And we can say that, too, well, yeah, it's a functional language, so it's gonna have less data in general than the most auditor-oriented languages, but that's, again, it is not important. Let's um, put some more data over here. Okay, yes. just gonna save that. And then it's gonna go to the next one. Sorry. So, we have talked that about REST being an architectural span, not having you having to define everything every single time. GraphQL, on the other hand, is an actual define architecture, okay? Things will work in a very specific way. You don't have to define it. The elements are exactly the same for every GraphQL API that you create. You have a schema, and that schema is gonna have the same format every single time, okay? You always need what they call resolvers, which are the function or methods that retrieve the data to supply to the, to the request. You always use a single URL with a post request to which you are querying for your data. And the client is, is the same, it doesn't matter how many APIs you make, the, the, because you are always querying exactly the same way and getting the return, return, uh, the return exactly the same way, you can create the, the same basic client using for everything. Okay. Uh, Remove this, I need it. 
We're just gonna add Oops. Them. And we are not done with this with this uh, demo of a of an application. Oh. We're just gonna remove this line over here, which we don't need. And hopefully, if everyone if everything has gone all right and haven't forget, forgotten to copy anything of course closure takes a bit of time to compile first time around <laughs> cool all running we're gonna put this over here let's gonna see if it works uh, host oh, there we have that's a standard uh, application as I say same query for every single application so they can provide uh, an application that can query GraphQL APIs because so all of them the same and I'm gonna select some policies and I'm gonna get the IDs okay and I'm making a query and getting information back there and well, it's gonna get the usernames now. And I'll get the usernames. Then it's gonna add the books. Which the books, they have an ID, and they have a name, and it's working. But it's gonna filter and only show books that have an ID of two. Oops. Uh, now I'm filtering. Let's gonna use another query that I have defined over here. Let's gonna delete all this and this. So user by ID. Oops, ID. So let's gonna show just the user which an ID of two. And ID and the games that he has. Oh, games. Name, uh, hit enter, and I get an information back. And this, this is what makes GraphQL awesome. A few lines of code and a few minutes. I mean, I've been copy pasting over here just to try not to spend too much time on my keyboard and I still have done it. But the original, I, I wrote that and it's, it's code that could be better written in closure, but I wrote that in 20 minutes. How can you make an API, a race API in 20 minutes that you have searching and filtering in it, and that you can select the different, um, the different fields that you can return? It doesn't happen. Speed, the speed of development is for me probably a killer feature of GraphQL. And um, yes. Oh. Okay. Just to finalize. REST is modeling processes. GraphQL is modeling data. REST is an architectural style. While GraphQL is an a fixed architecture. It's a defined architecture. And GraphQL is quick. These are the tools that I have used uh, over here. Pedestal is a, was a, a library for closure for web, web development on server side. La Senia is the GraphQL implementation that I have used. And if you look, want to look at the code, which no, is great, that's where I have it stored. Any questions? No, okay. Um, just in case, I will be here. So you want to ask any questions? You can farm it. I mean, farm it all. Ask it, rather. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Nice to meet you. Um, does that work? Do you hear me? Yeah? Great. Um, hello. Thanks for coming. I'm, uh, I, don't I have a talk for the first time, so I'm a bit nervous. I hope you will be easy on me. Um, this talk is Action from Work, how Tagless Final helps us uh, to write machine code. The star next to Tagless Action from Work means that the name is still in work, it might change, so don't stick to this name, so hard. Okay, about me. Uh, I'm Alexander Polishchuk, I'm working here in Revolut, uh, I'm a senior developer at Revolut. Uh, I'm working here for about two years, um, MVP and Scala enthusiast. Um, I really like to write uh, code in Scala. In my opinion, it's the best language. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, let me say a few words about my domain. Uh, it will be easier to you to understand uh, on which uh, thing I am working because the examples will be uh, from this domain. Um, I'm part of customer experience team in here inside Revolut. Our project is uh, chat, back office, uh, chatbot. Uh, I'm leading chat application uh, on backend side. Chat application is our main service communicating with customers, uh, the main way to communicate with customers. When customer has some issue or has just question, he comes to chat, so chat should be always available and um, working basically so basically let me show some numbers uh, just to understand what the scale is it might be not so big but uh, still uh, in total we have about 4 million of users more than 4 million of users more than 15 millions of requests per day um, more than 200,000 web sockets in any moment about 8,000 chats per day it's not that much, but it could vary and could be more or less. Uh, also, about 100 agencies working simultaneously on the project. Uh, on our back, back end, uh, no, not back end, but uh, our back office part of the chat, where they have tickets, other stuff. And we are running everything only in three nodes with two CPU cores and eight gigs of RAM. And in Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, let me show, um, we will, this talk will be split into following parts. First part is motivation, why we came with the uh, action for what what issues face it, uh, what the reason to implement such thing. Next we will quickly, I will quickly invite us to Tagless Final. Actually, I assume that you already know what is Tagless Final, I hope so. Uh, could you raise hand who know what is Tagless Final? Oh, <laughs> it will be very brief. I also will uh, share some links to great talks by Luca Jagabut about Tagless Final. So, next will be a quick introduction to Action Framework. I will mm, briefly discuss the main components, uh, uh, main components, and make uh, some theoretical background about what this stuff and how it works. Then we will fin finally come to examples. Uh, they, the examples is only unfortunately in slides. I will, uh, we are not yet ready, ready yet to open source the solution. That why I can't show the exact uh, real program. So uh, this but uh, they still will be from my domain, but they will be highly simplified. And last part will be uh, conclusion, drawbacks, and uh, future plans about uh, action for more. So, motivation. Um, we want uh, our motivation was to achieve uh, safety, decoupling, and code reuse. Classic service implementation. Sorry. What the fuck? Oh. Sorry, <laughs> let me put to. Mm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, classic service implementation usually has many problems. Uh, 
you might have experienced yourself, like uh, transaction boundaries, oppression between services, uh, they break and error prone. Um, it happens to us many times. Uh, the necessity to use a same transaction for some uh, different uh, parts of the application uh, creates messy with uh, dependencies and uh, shadowing some boundaries of the operation. We might run into code that uh, produces some effects that you should not uh, do. Oh. No, finally. Sorry, <laughs> I finally <laughs> disabled this ringtone. Um, uh, so we will, we are shadowing the boundaries, and we can really uh, run into the issues. Also, often broken simple responsibility principle. Uh, for example, in our pre uh, previous uh, ticket service, uh, we had a method that should uh, resolve ticket, and uh, this method not only uh, have resolved. Uh, ticket that also will was responsible for sending push messages, for example, to client. And we had to test this method and uh, also the test the push logic alongside or mock it, but we basically had to m uh, do much more work than we need to do. And uh, other issue, uh, read and write parts often couplet, so we can scale them, we can achieve more or more independent uh, solution from write and read parts. Technically, we want to write less code and test, not because we are lazy, but because we want to uh, reuse our components as much as possible. Um, so, for example, uh, the function programming is about to dividing your code logic into small reasonable pieces, then uh, testing them independently and compose them together, then com test composition and so on. Basically, you uh, build your mm, program from small bricks, from like le Lego parts, and make your application more robust and uh, easier to control. But in reality, reality is not about pure functions. It's more about uh, impurity, like caches, databases, or party services. So we many services which in real real production uh, services, they usually interact with many things like this, and your service starts to be, be like one big pile of impurity. You have to deal with everything. So in order to regain this ability to test and think about uh, stuff with uh, more effect free, like um, without necessary to think about this uh, stuff that happens uh, along the way in the background. We wanted to build more, uh, we want to, mm, sorry, uh, achieve more separate uh, concerns, our more business logic and push uh, environment to boundaries like, you know, uh, ports and adapters architecture or clean architecture. Uh, uh, gives you that kind of ideas, and finally, why? Oh, and finally, why one another in five solution? So basically, there are a lot of solutions that provide you different kind of uh, stuff, uh, different level of implementation for different parts, but there are no single solution which provide all of them uh, in one place. Uh, and uh, we wanted to have more control our implementation, our what features it has. So for us, it was a uh, reasonable choice to implement our internal solution. So briefly about Douglas Final. Douglas Final is an, an operation to separate its implementation detail, implementation and the uh, program itself. It helps how you define embedded DSL and build a r subset of host language, which is sound, type safe, and pure, uh, and predictable. Uh, the notation uh, is using higher kind of or uh, higher kind of types in order to decouple effect definition and implementation. 
that allow us to hide implementation impurity and uh, switch between async or sync execution to introspect program and optimize it or to collect intermediate state for test or audit. Douglas final uh, could be used with uh, together with uh, type classes in order to um, define implementation boundaries and uh, boundary context to your Douglas final application. Douglas final is very similar to three minutes, but much simpler, less boilerplate, and uh, much more performant. So if you'd like to know more about Douglas final, you can check these two talks by Luke Jakovic. In one of them, he thinks about how to, uh, you can um, optimize your program, how it's better to, uh, to three minutes. And second one is the example of building new uh, API on on top of um, like impure uh, impure program is with using um, Douglas final approach. I will upload this presentation in future and maybe share a li link with functional works so they will be able to post them and uh, this link will be available to uh, those talks or you can just google uh, look at Jacobus in YouTube and you will receive maybe first or second link for to these talks. Okay, so in progress to action framework. Action framework is about four key aspects. Model, action, repository, and listener. Uh, first of all, it's action. So what is action? Action in substrate leads operation that ha holds and it belongs to interconnected domains define uh, clear business, in business intention like resolve ticket, rate agent, or send message. All performant operations are stored within batch, and of course this batch is immutable. Action is only, only blueprint. It hides implementation details and could be executed in later time. Um, it's much similar, it's very similar to Freemonad because Freemonad also use list of operation. Uh, it use uh, ADT or generic ADT in order to achieve this list operation. Uh, this flat map, it composes the solution into some unit of work and program uh, definition and uh, interpretation are separate parts. But additionally to these uh, qualities, we place two more uh, contracts. First of all, action should be atomic. All either all operation uh, should be successful or none of them. Uh, Atomic recurrence on ATP is what uh, that makes this solution so powerful, and uh, we love be because of that we love this approach. Concrete atomic strategy might be different to implementation. Uh, our implementation use uh, database transactions and optimistic logs in order to achieve this solution. Uh, second one, hmm? second one is uh, action plan plays some guarantees on concurrency. You might change multiple models within same action, along with uh, concurrently with other actions, but there are some limitation. I will come back to this in neurobacks part and how we can uh, avoid this limitation. Uh, you also can call s any third party service, remote third party or local third party service uh, within action, but all operations uh, that you call, you care about in the independency and uh, Concurrency by yourself, so it's on all in your hands. Uh, next, I will be briefly um, talk about model repository and listener. Uh, model is uh, um, we separate uh, models by business domains. Uh, we will utilize uh, DDD principles uh, to in order to decouple them. Uh, model is like uh, DDD aggregate root. Uh, Model, model manage its own consistency and could have multiple value objects inside. Uh, when you upgrade model, it uh, emits event instead of uh, di direct change, and event handler uh, runs called operation in order to uh, receive new version of the model. Uh, and these events could be uh, later used in listeners, or in audit, or even event sourcing in future. So, next think is a uh, repository. It's part of framework that complements actions. It helps us to build secure, S, secure IRS applications. And on top of um, repository, you can build whatever IP you like. It could be REST, it could be GRPC, 
or it could be even GraphQL implementation. And last but not least, it's listeners. It's our event drying up feature, which uh, rely on events produced by the models during action um, operation. And upon successful action, uh, all listeners will be dispatched through a synchronous event bus. So all this feature together uh, creates a unique ecosystem uh, that allow you to build um, simple applications. You can rapidly uh, develop your features without relying on building how you should uh, do this or that or whatever. And uh, it's easy to test the key feature for us. So we finally uh, end with uh, theory. Let's uh, see some examples. I will use really simplified uh, example from our domain. Our domain is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, customer support. So there will be our uh, the old example will be around the ticket model. Okay, uh, mind all API is not finalized yet and could be changed. Okay, uh, let's start from model element. Uh, in order to define, for example, ticket, we need to extend our model from uh, model aggregate type, which are permitted by the model itself. Also, you should define two, three type. A self type is used to event handler in order to, dis uh, to um, and handler should know what the concrete type of the model, but the uh, self uh, type bounded permutation in uh, model aggregate uh, might be more uh, b uh, common. It could be not just ticket, but could be, for example, if you use transaction, it could be uh, ATM transaction or uh, card transaction into se uh, self type, but in uh, model base, it could be just transaction. Um, next type is uh, S. It means state. It, uh, the type of the ticket state. Uh, e. It means base type for the event. Event type. Um, next, uh, we define some methods that mutate our. Not mutate. It's uh, the program which use exactly tag toggles final notation with uh, bounded type uh, context bounded type of model API, which had the, uh, all the methods uh, that needed to perform alteration like create, update, delete, and uh, the F what will be uh, implemented in some uh, some far away from here, not in the model. So there are no implementation details that leaks uh, to model about how it will be run. Um, in model API extends uh, man and error. So you are able to, to perform all operation, all, all checks within uh, the method. So like we do here, we check that our model is uh, in open or resolved state in, in, in order to perform a uh, state change operation. Uh, and if uh, the model is not in this state, the error with message uh, ticket must be open will be raised. After check is OK, we, we're using uh, product write uh, operation to compose these operations. We perform state change operation. State change operation will perform will store in update the ticket state change event. In if uh, state was changed, if it wasn't changed, it will return the same operation. So we think in our business logic that uh, change uh, the resolved operation for same ticket is a dependent. Uh, to uh, if a resolved operation for a ticket with state resolved will be a dependent, and we can return uh, the same type of the model. Okay. Uh, the event handler is defined into ticket com uh, in ticket object companion. Uh, it extends aggregate companion, uh, parameterized by uh, the event of the ticket type and uh, by ticket itself. You here can create um, any amount of uh, fabrics to uh, create new model, which will call create API of the model API itself. And you define here event handler in order to Accumulate new state of the uh, new new version of the uh, ticket. Here we have ticket created event uh, that creates new version of the ticket, and uh, ticket state change modifies new uh, already existing model to new state. Now, interesting part: how we test them. Uh, we have uh, several type of helpers to uh, test this model. Uh, we use uh, you have uh, model assertion trait that implements simplified version of the model API 
with the more simple state, so you can introspect your the operations you performed during uh, uh, in test uh, scope, and you can check that uh, all events was uh, raised emitted like you think, and uh, the state sun style is the correct state. Uh, in order to do this, you have uh, three uh, simple methods. Uh, first one is event that checks for some event that belongs to this uh, model type and it exists in uh, your mm, uh, like in your s list of operations sorry somebody really wants me okay <laughs> uh so, uh, second met method is uh, create. Uh, it uh, basically uh, checks that model was created due to execution, not updated, and updates uh, otherwise uh, checks uh, that model was uh, updated, not created, and you can perform also additional asserts uh, for the model in the closure. So this is an example of how we test, for example, for ticket open operation. We perform this operation. Uh, we pass the result to assert model API, and we retrieve the assert. Uh, we check that uh, in the assertion that event was uh, created. Uh, the ticket event, uh, ticket created event was raised. We retrieve. Um, version of the ticket and perform uh, all checks uh, that uh, creation performed all uh, set all valid uh, all correct uh, properties from the event to the ticket model and uh, the state is uh, begin from the open next uh, is the ticket resolve uh, for already existing model we check that uh, this uh, operation has raised event for ticket state change, uh, that all properties are correct, and we performed update operation, and only update at, uh, and state uh, properties was changed. This is uh, really simple and straightforward test, so you basically can write a lot of a lot of tests without thinking too much and fastly continue back to your impl future implementation. Uh, this is uh, our uh, like dictionary repository, which we we'll use to retrieve any type of model, it permits with uh, the model itself, and uh, uh, we using type reference projection in order to retrieve uh, the type from uh, uh, generic parameters and uh, to modify all parameters for this uh, repository. We using a type reference pro projection in order to decrease amount of the generic parameterization for this interface. Uh, and uh, make it more pretty and uh, easy to use from call side. Uh, this API is considered to be removed in Dota, unfortunately, because uh, in some cases, not in our case, uh, this API was considered as unsound because there are some flashes in type uh, inference. And uh, we might remove uh, this in and replace with dependent types instead. Okay, now this is how our ticket resolve action looks like. Uh, we, I'm here for simply uh, for the matter of simplicity. I'm using concrete type parameterization here, but you can also use abstract type parameterization. Here I'm using uh, Monix task uh, in order to run all this action in this scope of spec uh, action. Uh, in order to implement action, you need only to extend action. Uh, trait uh, define uh, three type parameters uh, p for input params r for return type and the caller principle who is the calling for who can call this action and define next you define uh, execution method which comes with the action uh, trait inside of execution you are tra basically retrieve for existing model uh, with uh, params inside, uh, with ID in params, uh, you next lift. Lift. We need to perform lift in order to lift task type to batch type 
which is on, in return position, and in flat pump, we perform just resolve operation. All operations within uh, execute method will be through, uh, through composition will be collected inside because our batch type implementation on the circuit is, is state key monad, which helps us to accumulate all operations, and later we can um, introspect them, optimize, or do whatever we want. So, for action testing, uh, we are use very similar approach, but slightly different. We have a run method to in order to perform operation uh, to run action with uh, all given parameters. Then we can check for either successful or failed operation inside and uh, extract uh, the return value of the action or uh, error if we expect that execution was failed. In assert uh, method, we can check all operations that happen inside uh, action. And because uh, we already have tested everything in models about uh, how action, uh, how even event is translated to the model, we can assert only for events inside of action execution. So our API provides you with ability to extract all events uh, from execution and check, assert all properties that they have. Also, you optionally can skip for uh, some ki sort of events uh, that you don't interest in particular, maybe because uh, your concrete test case doesn't check a particular change, but only for exist uh, concrete uh, events, you're waiting for some concrete event. Uh, by the way, I forgot to talk that model and the action assertion, they uh, check, uh, they check that all operation was covered, and if you forget for some operation within batch, it will draw exception, so you don't ever forget that some logic you have ordered, but you forget to test it. Um, okay, so this is how it looks uh, our test. Uh, for example, here we uh, create existing ticket. It's uh, basically, given exists is basically mock operation that mocks domain repository for given ticket. Uh, ticket is basically in open state by default. With this ticket, we perform a uh, run for our action. Subject is uh, an action, and principle is basically whatever uh, we want, uh, principle that calls for this action. Upon successful, we expect successful execution, and uh, the execution will return new version of the ticket, and we check that it was resolved. And inside of assert operation, we will assert for expected event that uh, this ticket was, uh, this correct model ID uh, has chan changed state and the new state of this model is resolved. Uh, another test is test for dependency that we made for when state is the uh, same. We basically create for ticket that's in the resolved state and we check that we expect uh, exactly the same version of the ticket after successful execution and the operation are empty, nothing to do because uh, the version of the state doesn't change, wasn't changed. And the negative, uh, let me show negative uh, test case. Uh, here we have ticket in closed state, which is not expected by resolved operation. And uh, we check that um, we expect failed execution for action and the validation error was drawn with the correct uh, message. Uh, for example, here we expect the ticket must be open. So, last part is our listeners. Uh, listeners um, define pretty straightforward. You extend uh, listener, uh, you extend uh, pretty listener is defined for some particular event. Uh, it could be more narrow or broader. Uh, it basically checks for that uh, listener is instance of, and uh, you also define two additional method. Uh, first one, observe, that checks uh, additional, performs additional checks for given uh, event. Here we check that expected event should be with uh, target state of resolve, and if uh, this target state is resolved, the handle method will be called with uh, principal who has called the action, original action, where this event was emitted with event, and the additional parameters of dictionary with all actions, where you can Execute more additional actions, but here we, uh, for example, send for push message about that uh, to client about that particular ticket was resolved, 
and as you can see, we 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 don't uh, we don't break uh, the single responsibility principle. We perform only reserve operation in action, but in in our listeners, we perform all extra operation like sending message to client or whatever we like, and we can stack them independently without any issues. Uh, in order to follow action, it's pretty simple. You can either run with parameterization of the action or run retriable. Run retriable um, performs multiple attempts to run your action on optimistic log exception with particular tolerance. Uh, if you pass this parent here, we use default tolerance using uh, either uh, count based uh, retry policy or uh, timing based policy. Right now, default is uh, 500 milliseconds uh, retry policy. So your action should be, could be retried if uh, it runs faster than 500 milliseconds. Um, that's all about examples of actions. So let's quickly talk about our throwbacks. So listeners are not transactional. They fail or operation might never happen due to shutdown for example. So you need either backup them with some job or other background process or you have to implement something like sagas with persistent under underlying persistence. But sagas will bring sa more extra complexity to, our to your applications. Um, next issue is optimistic clock is not cellular valid. You never uh, able to to test, for example, you, you, you are able to perform uh, concurrent uh, inserts in the same time and they will be uh, all uh, proceed. Uh, to in order to mitigate this issue in particular, uh, you can use uh, request ID from client. Uh, it will basically will create ID for you and you will be able to correlate using this ID or you will be you can use database logs or uh, some constraints, for example, if you expect then only one ticket in open state, then you can hold this constraint. Uh, or other approach is to use correlated entity. For example, uh, if you send message, you also update uh, last message table. Yeah, and if uh, last message table fails on optimistic clock, then insert will also fail. Okay, uh, this about optimistic clocks. Um, this, uh, it's bad to call another action from action within. It's because uh, we are using uh, optimistic logs and uh, all operations are performed uh, in the end. If you call for other action inside, uh, there could be issue that uh, nested action will have uh, some stale uh, picture of the world and uh, you basically will fail, always fail because of that. Um, in our opinion, this is not a big deal because if you trying to call other action from within the action, it's probably something wrong with your design of application. Uh, you're basically trying to segregate, um, not you will be different um, uh, concerns you use in same place. So we don't want to solve this I issue, at least for this uh, point of time. And our future plans, uh, we want to evolve this approach we want to clean up API and make more further decoupling. Uh, we, we want to out op optional open sourcing support with uh, maybe uh, configurable consistency. Also, we'd like to have uh, built-in support for Sagas in order to perform all hard operations with listeners or to perform uh, operations that has multiple steps and run in background. Uh, we want to rem remove uh, uh, run retriable call explicitly and make it implicitly based on some mm, like uh, every, every action will, will uh, define its own strategy and uh, policy to perform. Uh, could it be retriable? Is this action independent or not? Something like this. And we might open source the solution uh, when it will be ready and it will be depends on the interest on from you to this solution. If you will be interested, we will be more motivation to open source it. So, question and answers. Uh, so, when you're uh, during an action, you're emitting uh, emitting events. 
first. During the next turn, you uh, you are emitting demons, are you? Uh, one more time. During an action, during an execution of yes. an action, you are emitting. So you may uh, emit some events. You basically only emitting events, and events uh, perform new operations. So it's kind of event sourcing approach, but without event sourcing. The listeners are not transactional, but uh, is emitting transactional. So I mean that you are you f your action may fail, and you have to retry it. Would you? Emit multiple events in that case? Or? No, it uh, will be only sent uh, for a commit. So we perform uh, action operation within transaction, and all uh, events, uh, if you want to source them to event source, for example, we using this approach, will be also performed inside of transaction. But after transaction, we dispatch all events if action execution is successful. So only you're, you're, you're only going to uh, distribute, distribute the transaction in this case, or you're storing the uh, emitted events in, in your own database? Or uh, Just asking. Uh, we store uh, some application store events in order to uh, retract some more features like uh, logic based on events or perform further audit, but some application doesn't store it. So this is basically uh, our groundwork for future support for event sourcing. So wh when your types are changing over time, yeah, H how do you handle that case where you uh, basically... You mean, uh, you mean model evolution? Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, we don't have this issue because we, must we don't have event sourcing <laughs> <laughs> yet. But uh, in future we will think about how to evolve, how to provide uh, backward and forward uh, capability for events. Probably it will have some type safe schema. Anyone else? Questions? So, I don't really get it. Well, what, what's the whole point? Well, you could either do all of this, yeah. or you could just write some really simple code that looks like it's been written by a high school kid in Visual Basic. Yeah, basically, uh, we start thing. from uh, sim very simple code. We start, we start from very simple code in our project. It was basically not stereo service architecture, but we start to grow, 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 and we had many issues, like I said, with boundaries of transaction, with uh, simplicity of uh, your code writing. Uh, when we started to looking for solution, we decided to came this in-house, basically, grant, because we have uh, this, the lot uh, solution provides some sort of uh, these patterns, but uh, they are usually independent. We just bring them under our umbrella and perform our solution with it. And uh, we retrieve, receive much more rapid development mm, process with this approach. Okay. Is this an answer for your question? Well, uh, so, 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 is this, so I do you really need this extensibility or, or is it? Uh yes. Piggybacking on his question, actually, in that case, um, just one slip. You, you, ma you mentioned that you're gonna open this code, but uh, it's at least uh, according to the presentation, it's it's, three, um, it's strongly uh, connected to your domain, right? And consider what he said and that he said that it evolved all the time. Maybe uh, maybe you didn't show that in the example, but I'm I'm thinking. Um, W wouldn't it be possible to have the same solution using, let's say, cats types, and uh, make we sure are that using you have cats oh. for this? Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> so uh, we have similar approach uh, with our Java application, as what in the beginning told. Uh, that basically, this approach is uh, writing in order to uh, uh, gain all features we have in Scala, like higher kind of types and effects execution. And we are using almost in every our project this approach, so it scales to any domain, at least within uh, fintech. Good. That's all.
thank you very much for hearing uh, me. Uh, yeah, that's it for this evening, but thank you very much to our host, to all the staff, to all the speakers. Um, if uh, if anyone is keen on speaking, we are always, always uh, on the lookout. So just come grab me at the end if you want to have a chat. But thanks very much for coming, and we'll see you at the next one in April. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rajiv. Yeah, that was great. Well done. Hmm? That's it. Thank you. Twice. <laughs> so, how do you think?